morning. This meeting of the Rules Committee is called to order. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make the remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at the public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligence prior to the hearings and can also be found on philcouncil.com. Would a clerk please call the roll to take attendance. Members that are in attendance will please indicate that they are present when their names are called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on the screen when you speak. Would a clerk call the roll, please? Mark Squilla. Present. David O. Cindy Bass. Good morning, I am present. Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Good morning, I'm present. Bobby Heenan. Maria Jonas Sanchez. Good morning, good morning. Curtis Jones Jr. Mr. Chairman, colleagues, listening audience, good morning. And Brian O'Neill. That's it for all, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. A quorum of the committee is present, and this is the hearing. This hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the committee on rules regarding bills numbers two zero zero five one six, two zero zero five seven one, two zero zero five seven six, two zero zero five seven seven, two zero zero five nine two, two zero zero six zero one, two zero zero six zero two. 200604, 200613, and 200654. Before we begin, I wanted to announce that bill number 200594 will be held until further notice. <clears throat> Please let the record reflect that bill number 200594 is being held at the request of the sponsor and will be heard at a later date. Um, before the clerk reads the title of the bill, I would like to acknowledge um, the presence of Councilman Bobby Heenan. Would the clerk please read the titles of the bills? Bill number 200516, amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by creating an overlay district entitled Winfield Overlay District to include certain areas of land within the area bounded by City Avenue, Bryn Mawr Avenue, Parkside Avenue, 53 Street, Upland Way, and Drexel Road under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 200576, amending section 14513 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Neighborhood Conservation Overlay District by revising and clarifying certain provisions and making related changes all under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 200577, amending title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning to revise certain provisions of chapter 14-200 entitled Definitions and chapter 14-500 entitled Overlay Zoning Districts by amending the provisions of the Wissahickon Watershed Overlay all in, under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 200592, amending the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within the area bounded by Wissahickon Avenue, Hunting Park Avenue, Fox Street and Roberts Avenue. Bill number 200604, to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designation of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Byberry Road, Woodhaven Road, the Bekessing Creek and adjacent lands south of Franklin Mills Circle. Bill number 200601, amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by amending certain provisions of Chapter 14-500 entitled Overlay Zoning Districts by creating the Haverford Village Overlay District and amending the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designation of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Wallace Street, 36th Street, Mount Vernon Street, and 37th Street. 
Bill number 200602, amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Zoning and Planning, by amending certain provisions of Chapter 14-500, entitled Overlay Zoning Districts, by creating the 30th Street Overlay District, and by re revising certain provisions of Section 14-702, entitled Floor Area, Height, and Housing Unit Density Bonuses, and amending the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designation of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Chestnut Street, 30th Street, Walnut Street, and 31st Lower Level Street. Bill number 200571, to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designation of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Diamond Street, 11th Street, Nora Street, and Marvine Street. Bill number 200654, authorizing the procurement commissioner to enter into agreements to purchase electricity, natural gas, and motor fuel for use by the city and city facilities and vehicles, including agreements that obligate payment for delivery of such energy supplies in future fiscal years, all under certain terms and conditions. And finally, bill number 200613, amending title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning, by creating a new Strawberry Mansion NCO bounded by Lehigh Avenue, 29th Street, Sedgley Avenue, Montgomery Avenue, Conrail Right-of-Way, Oxford Street, and 33rd Street under certain terms and conditions. Thank you. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded because the hearing is public. Participants and viewers have no reasonable expectations of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are considering to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available on Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Before the clerk call the first panel, I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of Councilman Brian O'Neill. Would the clerk please call the first panel for bill number 200516. Before the clerk call the first panel, I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of Councilman David O. Thank you, Chairman. Paula Brumblow Burns. Good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, City Planner with the Legislative Team of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on Bill Number 200516, which was introduced into City Council on October 1st, 2020, by Council Member Jones. Bill Number 200516 amends the Philadelphia Zoning Code by creating the WYN. Winfield Overlay District to include certain areas of land within the area bounded by City Avenue, Bryn Mawr Avenue, Parkside Avenue, 53rd Street, Jefferson Street, 54th Street, Upland Way, and Drexel Road. The proposed bill, the WYN Winfield Overlay District, shall require principal uses otherwise permitted of all commercially zoned lots within the boundaries listed above to get a special exception from the Zoning Board of Adjustments for the following uses, consumer goods, food, beverages, and groceries, sundries, pharmaceuticals, and convenience sales, and drug paraphernalia sales. This bill was requested by the community in an effort to eliminate tobacco and drug paraphernalia sales in Winfield. While we are sympathetic to the problems that the community wants to address, such as not having tobacco sales, these issues may be better solved through enforcement by the health department. This bill impacts several basic commercial uses and necessities such as sales of consumer goods, grocery stores, and pharmacies in an effort to regulate tobacco sales. With the new overlay, these businesses would be required to go to the zoning board, which can take up to six months or longer. This can have unintended consequences on commercial development and present a hardship for small business owners. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 200516 at its meeting of October 20th 2020 and recommended not for approval. I will be ha happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much for your testimony. 
Well, members of the committee, have any questions or comments? Councilman Curtis Jones want to acknowledge you because it's your bill first. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And this particular bill shows why your committee that you chair is vitally important to the quality of life of citizens in neighborhoods in the city of Philadelphia. In the fourth councilmatic district, like most districts, I have over 50 community-based organizations, RCOs, and recognized community groups that have a day-to-day -day responsibility for the quality of life within their boundaries. Um, Winfield in particular, in the case of this, um, this particular overlay, you have to go in, his, in, in, his, in history to know that Winfield is uh, founded, was founded by Dr. Winfield uh, in an effort to get away from inner city issues. And they, they consider these country homes, that this was moving to the country uh, to get away from the uh, hustle and bustle of the inner city. It is a proud location that is the first location of a registered stone house. The first stone house in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was erected in Winfield. Carrying on that history for a very long time, Mr. Chair, members of this committee, they fought against bars. They protested uh, uh, places that sold alcohol and now in the evolution of things are have fought um, uh, pill dispensaries, marijuana dispensaries, because, not because they're uh, seniors saying, I don't want you playing on my lawn, but they want that quality of life in their neighborhood to be handed down to their children and grandchildren. Um, I grew up and played in the very area that we're talking about, Mr. Chairman, um, and we have been beset with, with a type of store that I I'll be careful to not to stereotype, but I'm, I'm sure other members of this committee and, and members of council understand what I mean. These stores do not care about hours. Now, I'm not talking about 7-Elevens and, you know, 24-hour uh, convenience stores. I'm talking about they set up shop and their primary source of revenue is tobacco sales, that are um, flavored tobacco, that are paraphernalia to be used not for smoking tobacco, but for other things that, you know, some young people like. This has created a competition on some of our commercial corridors and competition among people who sell the products that go with that paraphernalia. And in so doing, there have been spikes in shootings, and I did a, uh, a hearing once upon a time in another a, uh, a session where we talked about the geography of crime, which means where crimes happen within 50 feet of a particular location, then that should give you a signal to pay attention to those locations. And when you have 24-hour sites that not only uh, are, are, are violating people's sanctity. Like people can't get rest. Those lights that blink on and off in a high intensity that keep you awake at night just to let people know that are driving by in vehicles that they are open and ready for their business. They're not talking about a sit down meal, sir. They're not talking about vital uh, commodities that you need for medicine and things like that or that loaf of bread you forgot to get, they're talking about these activities that while by right are not illegal, just because something is allowable doesn't mean you should do it. Doesn't mean that it goes with the vignette of the community historically, architecturally, and just by way of the peace and tranquility of the area. So my community, Mr. Chair, has been up in arms. When I tell you up in arms, um, they are a, a, a responsive community, activist community, and they are, they are beside themselves 
as the, to the proliferation of stores that do not even ask them what they think about their operations, what they sell, who they attract. And I will not go on record saying that they are working with nefarious entities that sell those other products. But if a tree falls in the woods and no one's hears, was there a sound? If there is an uptick in crime and shooting in an area when a store opens, we want to pay attention to it. So I am asking that not just for Winfield's sake, but we don't mind being the first at something, that we take a look at the proliferation of stores and make it just a little more arduous, one step more, which is talking to the community about their establishment, their hours of operation, and their interaction with the community that they want to derive profits from. Uh, and I thank my colleague, Catherine Gilmore, for being a online boots on the ground type of at large uh, uh, council person. She takes it right to where the initiating uh, problems are. And we were able to observe all kinds of behavior on that corridor that wasn't there before. And so with that, I, 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 I would urge my colleagues not only to support these bills, but to support looking at it from an at-large perspective and let the communities that these businesses wish to reside make their case to the community before the Planning Commission and Zoning Board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Councilman Kathleen Gilmore Richardson. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I rise today in support, in full support of my colleague and district council member, uh, council member Curtis Jones Jr., but also in support of Winfield Residents Association, also in support of Winfield Black Captains Association uh, and all the Winfield Cultural Center um, activity community. I rise in support of all of those organizations as a lifelong resident of Winfield. I have never lived in any other community in Philadelphia except Winfield. Uh, so I want to uh, say that I'm in full support of this legislation because there has been an oversaturation of uh, these uh, consumer goods, food and beverage and grocery convenience sale, drug paraphernalia sale, style stores in our community. If you can imagine from one block between uh, Morris and Montgomery on uh, 54th Street, we now have three convenience stores and a pizza shop and several other stores. And then you go right down the street on 54th Street between Burke Street and between Arlington. And as of right now, we have two convenience stores and they're trying to set up a third convenience store uh, at a location where one of our longtime business owners uh, just recently vacated. So you're talking about six convenience stores that are selling, you know, food and beverage and groceries, but also drug paraphernalia in a two block radius. That is completely unacceptable in a community when we are trying to maintain a certain quality of life in this area. On top of that, I want to bring your attention to several incidents that have taken place uh, over the last several weeks, not months or years, weeks. Eight hours uh, ago today, there was a commercial break in at Upland Way and Lebanon Avenue. Two weeks ago, on the corner of 53rd and Burks, one block from my house, there was a shootout with over 20 shots fired from several different weapons where I had to tell my children to get down on the ground. So we are facing issues in this community relative to gun violence as a result of those stores uh, being in that location. And I can tell you from personal experience that we have never dealt with that uh, before in this community. What I wanted to say uh, relative to uh, the testimony of the Planning Commission, I had a question for Paula. And what I wanted to know is what is the, planning's, uh, the Planning Commission's stance on gun violence in Philadelphia? We are absolutely looking to make sure that we support the work you do to create solutions to lower gun violence. It's not an acceptable way for neighbors to live and our residents deserve better than having gun violence in their neighborhoods. Agreed, which is why uh, I am 
uh, surprised that you all are not testifying in support of this overlay and in support of the Winfield community and the oversaturation of these businesses that bring that type of behavior to our community. I just wanted to say one last thing, Mr. Chair, uh, is that I think uh, this is a good example uh, as to why every single city department, every single city agency uh, needs to, to take gun violence uh, as serious as, as COVID-19 and as every other major issue we're dealing with uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Because if we were all looking at every issue that comes across our desks from the lens of trying to uh, prevent gun violence in our communities, I'm sure um, you know the stance from the planning commission on on this particular issue uh, would be different. So, Mr. Chair, again, I rise uh, in support of uh, my colleague, Councilmember Curtis Jones Jr., who was always on the ground listening to the community and in support of Winfield Residents Association, uh, Winfield Black Captains Association, WCCAC, uh, and all the, the residents of the Winfield community. We are standing today, standing tall to say, we are not going to let our community um, you know, be besieged um, by these type of stores and this behavior. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilwoman Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Councilmember Johnson, anyone... this is, the, this is uh, Mark Squilla. I just wanted to, I didn't put it in the chat, but I just wanted to add one thing. Um, as we, as we as council members look at representing our communities. It's so important to know that Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods and each neighborhood isn't the same. This is not an issue that we have um, just came about. This is an issue that's been going on for a while. And uh, I agree we have to do this holistically. But if we haven't done it now, uh, it's time for the council members to stand up and try to protect our communities and work with our communities. If this is going to be done holistically, then let's do it. Um, but in the meantime, we have to make sure that we stop the proliferation of some of these businesses in our residential communities. And it's, uh, I, uh, want to give credit to the sponsor, council member Jones. And as you heard, council member Gilmore Richardson, uh, for, you know, their charge to make sure that if, um, the city's not going to act and protect the communities that the council member has to uh, go forth and do these things. So, uh, you know, I'd be a strong supporter of this legislation and uh, look forward to working with the administration and uh, all parties involved, planning and L and I, to make sure they come up with something citywide that can protect the city from uh, these types of operations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Mark Squilla and Councilwoman Cindy Bass. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. Listen, I just wanted to uh, echo the sentiments of my colleagues. I also am in incredibly insulted that the community's <coughs> wishes are being overridden uh, by people who don't live in those neighborhoods and are making decisions contrary to what the people who live there want. I tell folks in my district, you don't have to have things in your neighborhood that you don't want. You have a vote, you have a voice. And this really does stand in the face of all of that. Uh, I've been fighting nuisance businesses for eight years now. And I really want to thank Councilman Jones. I want to thank Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson for giving us just, you know, another tool in the toolbox. And that being said, I have a question for the administration, which is prior to starting this hearing, as we were having conversation, the administration stated that they would like to take a comprehensive look at this problem citywide and that's why they were um uh standing against it which doesn't make sense to me because it's kind of like you know like in the city you really have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time but um you know there but but I, but i am concerned uh about uh the statement that they made in terms of doing a comprehensive study citywide so since this is what their intention is i'd like to know from the planning commission uh what has already been done prior to the introduction of this bill that, um, you know, uh, was um, uh, something that was uh, related to what we're trying to accomplish here, what was already done by the City Planning Commission. 
or I guess I should ask, was planning even aware that this was an issue prior to the introduction of the bill? The issue, I, be, I stepped up, sorry, I stepped up into the legislative role uh, in August. I've done legislation before, but I've stepped into this. So it was something new to me. We tried to be responsive. Once this bill was introduced, Council President Clark's office then asked us about it. And one of the things we want to do, first of all, is drug paraphernalia sales is not permitted in the code other than in certain industrial districts. It's actually not permitted. So we, we know it's an enforcement issue, but we have seen that clearly applicants are not being necessarily as upfront with what they're selling. So we want to kind of try and figure out how we can write the code to make sure they understand what is not allowed, but it's also to allow LNI to be, give greater enforcement. So we've been working with license and inspections on where we can fix this, what can be enforced. LNI has said, if anybody has any issues, to please give them a list and they will put it into we, enforcement immediately. And it's one where we're touching yeah, with I, the I, health I department. Mean, on their I don't mean process. to cut you off, but we, we've been working with LNI on these enforcement issues forever. And uh, I think, uh, you know, former Commissioner David Perry did a great job. You know, he really worked with us, but we still have an enforcement problem. So my question again is what was done prior to the introduction of this bill, not conversations that happen afterwards, but what, what if, if the planning department knew this was a problem and wanted to take it on citywide, I would like to know what was done already by the city in anticipation of dealing with this problem. So what, what I was trying to say is once uh, council member Jones came to us, we discovered how big of a problem it was. And then council okay. member, um, council president Clark. So that's when we said we should try to look at this in a bigger process. Okay. Well, I I'm, I'm asking this question because, um, with all due respect, um, when things go left in the neighborhood, people don't call the planning commission. They call Councilman Jones. They call Councilman Kenyatta Johnson. They call Councilwoman Maria Quinones Sanchez. Um, they call the at-largest two, Kathy Gilmore Richardson, of course, who lives in the neighborhood, and Councilman O and others. Um, you know, but but um, everybody in the Eighth District, I think, has my phone number and calls me. I'm willing to bet that no one is calling anyone from the planning commission when these things are going down. And so, um, you know, it's just really um, uh, a, a very, uh, it's, it's very difficult, um, particularly when you feel like you don't have the planning commission's backing on something this important for our neighborhoods. neighborhoods. And the other question I have is that everything the administration is done, um, according to the administration, is done through the prism of a racial equity lens. And so because this, um, Bill really does focus in on um, tobacco and other products of the of the like, uh, which we know um, uh, have a disproportionate effect in the community, are disproportionately saturated in our community. Um, based on that racial equity lens, can you tell me the what the prevalence of tobacco concentration is in minority communities, and is that something that came into your thinking? when you all were making a decision to not support this piece of legislation? I personally cannot tell you that answer of the percentage of communities. I can get that answer from probably the health department. That's not something that I have that information on. Um, and what it is, is it's, it's not that we dislike the content necessarily of the bill. It's the overlay to just one tiny narrow perspective of one community. Whereas well, we want to see if, that the issue is a citywide issue. If, the, if it was that's the, the case, overlay well, element, not if, the concept. If that's the case, I would urge the administration to stand in support of this bill and to work to make it citywide. I think that that's the answer that makes sense, not to stand against it and to come back later mm -hmm. and say, okay, well, we'll you know take another look at it. I, I would strongly encourage the administration to support this bill to figure out how we can do it citywide because i can already tell you you know we're, we're already looking at this in the eighth district so um i would just thoroughly encourage you to support this bill and to go back to the drawing board and figure out how can we make this 
citywide and improve upon it. So that's that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any other questions and comments from members of the committee? Councilman Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I have one last uh, question for the Planning Commission uh, relative to uh, any potential budget recommendations you can offer uh, City Council relative to, you know, either health and or l and around the enforcement issue um, or the issuance of the permits and the licenses. Um, any budget recommendations for us um, based on what you all are seeing relative to the lack of enforcement that you mentioned earlier uh, in your testimony. I think that would be helpful for us going into uh, the spring session as well. Just any recommendations specifically from the Planning Commission. Okay. I will make a note of that and pass it on. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Is anyone else here to testify on this bill. Okay, hearing done. Would the clerk please call the next panel for bill number 200-576. Paula Brumblow Burns. I'm sorry, I was making a note. Good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I'm Paula Brumbelow Burns, City Planner with the Legislative Team of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on Bill Number 200576, which was introduced into City Council on October 22nd, 2020, by Council Member Jones. Bill Number 200576 amends the Philadelphia Zoning Code by amending the section pertaining to NCOs, the Neighborhood Conservation Overlay District. This bill makes minor technical amendments to the provisions of several NCO areas and would introduce a formal appeal process for the review of building permits within all NCOs. Under this process, for any building permit application that Planning Commission staff determines does not meet the design standards of an NCO, an applicant could request additional review by the appointed Planning Commission the commission would be able to permit applications that deviate from the design standards only if the applicant first notifies all affected RCOs and if they determine that there is an unreasonable hardship and that approval would not harm the purpose of the NCO. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 200576 at its meeting of November 17th, and while staff recommended approval, the commission requested an additional 45 days for review. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you for your testimony, Councilman Curtis Jones. Yes, again, this is not as uh, impactful as the other bills, but as important. These kinds of technical cha changes allow for appropriate uses of uh, businesses and zoning uh, in places that probably for one reason or another got left out. So we appreciate working with the um, planning commission on these types of things uh, to try to uh, get the codes corrected so that we can maximize, maximize development in the city of Philadelphia where appropriate, where appropriate. So I did not want to give the impression, Mr. Chairman, that we were anti-development because we're not, we're not anti-tax revenue because we need it, but we want to get it right where appropriate. So I thank you uh, for your consideration. Thank you very much, Councilman Jones. Any other questions and comments from members of the committee? Anyone else here to testify on bill number 200-577? Okay, we're hearing none. Will the clerk please call the, first, the next panel for bill number 200-592. My apologies, did we just hear 200-576? So we should be moving on to 200-577, correct? Okay. That is correct. Thank okay. you, Brett. Will the clerk please call the next panel for bill number 200-577? Paula Brumblow Burns. 
Good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, City Planner with the Legislative Team of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on Bill Number 200577, which was introduced into City Council on October 22nd, 2010-20. I'm sorry, I just got my bills confused. Um, which was introduced into City Council on October 22nd, 2020 by Council Member Jones. Bill number 20577 amends Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code to revise certain definitions pertaining to the Wissahickon watershed overlay. The proposed bill is intended to clarify two provisions of the Wissahickon watershed overlay district. The first change would allow PWD to determine whether a proposal or whether a proposed man-made material is pervious for purposes of administering the stormwater infiltration provisions of the overlay district. The second change would define culvert as a tunnel embedded to carry a stream or open drain under a road or railroad and exclude swales channelized in culverts from the development setback provisions of the overlay district. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considers bill number 200577 at its meeting of November 16th, 2020 and recommended approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Councilman Curtis Jones. No comments on this bill. I think uh, it's it's really easy. It's about the environment. Thank you. <laughs> well, any any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, is anyone else here to testify on this bill? 200577. Hearing none, would a clerk please call the next panel for bill number 200592. Paula Brumblow Burns. Good morning, I'm Paula Brumblow Burns. I'm with the City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on bill number 200592, which was introduced into City Council on October 29th, 2020 by Council Member Jones. Bill number 200592 amends the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within the area bounded by the Wissahickon Avenue, Hunting Park Avenue, Fox Street, and Roberts Avenue. The proposed bill will remap two parcels located at 2250 and 2272 Wissahickon Avenue from I-2 Industrial to CMX-3 Commercial Mixed Use to allow for the Philadelphia Youth Basketball Program to locate on the site. The proposed use is a compatible use with the Croc Center, which is also zoned CMX-3, a private recreation facility located directly adjacent to these two parcels and the industrial commercial character of the Hunting Park West Industrial District. The proposed basketball program will benefit Philadelphia youth and is accessible via the routes H, H and XH buses both of which originate at the Broad and Erie Transit Hub. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered bill number 200592 at its meeting of November 17th, 2020 and recommended the bill for approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions and comments from members of the committee? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Councilman uh, Jones. This bill is all about recreation. Uh, we're talking about uh, changing the designation of the zoning of a old industrial uh, plant uh, and becoming uh, repurposed uh, to have, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 full court basketball runs where tournaments, national, local, statewide, uh, could be held uh, right in the heart of, of uh, North Philly, Paradise, and Allegheny West. And um, I think it has a citywide impact on what can be done there. But more important than just basketball, they're talking about mentoring, after school programs, um, kind of character building uh, processes for both men and women, uh, young men and women. And I think it's just value added in, in, and it could be considered an anti-violence measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Jones. I have one quick question. Do you know the square footage of the actual facility that's going to be um, built at this site? I am not aware, but I believe the attorney 
is present on the call to answer that may and may be able to answer that question. Mr. Chairman, uh, Matt McClure on behalf of uh, Philadelphia Youth Basketball. It's an existing facility where the uh, the basketball courts are going to be uh, built. Oh, Kenny. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's an okay. existing. It's, it's Hello, Councilman Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. I'm sorry, uh, Matt. Proceed. Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Holtzman's with me as well, Kenneth Holtzman, uh, who's from Philadelphia Youth Basketball. Kenny, do you know the square footage of the existing facility, what it's going to be after the construction? I do. It's uh, 93,000 square feet, uh, seven courts, five classrooms, a civic dialogue arena, a financial literacy workshop, a mental health and wellness facility, and then also a strength conditioning and injury rehab with a Philadelphia Basketball Hall of Fame and a Healthy Foods Commissary. Yeah. Awesome. Well, well, first, and, first and foremost, um, Kenny, um, it's always good to see you. I know your passion and your commitment um, to our young people. When I think about this facility, I think about Spooky Nook. I'm up in Lancaster, uh, which also offers a variety of different um, athletic um, opportunities and a facility for young people to engage in. In this particular project, I'm normally not a jealous person, but, um, you know, I'm just so excited. Uh, well, let me change it. I want for my brother what I want for myself. There you go. I'm excited what Councilman Jones is bringing to his district, working with you. Um, this is on the cutting edge of what we need to see in the city of Philadelphia right now. We are reaching 450 plus murders. And so at some point in time, we have to understand if we do not make young people a priority in this city, if we don't invest in them, we don't give them opportunities to get involved with things that are positive, such as this particular project, we will never be a great city because we will always deal with the issue of gun violence and losing our young men and women to senseless street violence. And so I thank and commend you for this particular project. Um, good job, Councilman Curtis Jones. Just wanted to state that for the record. Good partnerships, thank you. And it's citywide. So folk from the P will be able to come up and um, participate as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Any other questions and comments from members of this committee? Anyone else here to testify on this bill? Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you very much, Kenny. Thank you, Councilman. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilman. What, Thank you, Councilman. You're welcome. Would a clerk please call the next panel for bill number 200 Hello? Hello? Are you here to testify on the bill? Um. Yes. Brenda Saker. Hi, Brenda. Um, we will be doing public comment in one moment. Um, if you could mute yourself, we're just going to have the administration go first for the testimony, and then we will call your name. Okay. So, uh, thank you. first panel is Paula Brumblow Burns for Bill two zero zero six zero one. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I just there's so many bills. I want to make sure we're getting the right one today. I'm with, I'm with you. We so I am Paula Brumbelow Burns, city planner with the planning, Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I'm here to testify on bill number 200601, which was introduced into city council on October 29th, 2020 by council member Gautier. Bill number 200601 amends the Philadelphia zoning code maps by creating the HVO Haverford Village Overlay District and amending the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Wallace Street, 36th Street, Mount Vernon Street, and 37th Street. The proposed bill will remap the block to RM1 residential multifamily from RSA5 single family residential to support the redevelopment of PRA land for affordable housing on the block. The bill as introduced had an overlay portion which will be amended and removed as agreed to by the applicant and council member Gautier staff. The Philadelphia Zoning Planning Commission considered bill number 200601 at its meeting of November 17th, 2020 and recommended approval with amendments that the overlay section of the text be removed but keep the zoning maps. And I will be happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions and comments from members of the committee? 
Can I ask a question? Uh, one second. Uh, Please state your name for the record and you and say your testimony. My name is Brenda Stato. And my question is, for the zoning, you're saying that you're going to make it multi-family units instead of single family units? Just a point of clarification, too. I'm so sorry to interrupt. We are actually on um, bill number 200601. Brenda, you're actually going to be testifying on bill number 200571. So what you heard, not about the bill you are going to be testifying on. Okay. Sorry if there was confusion. I got a little mix. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. Is any other members of the committee have comments or questions for bill number 200601? Is anyone else here to testify on bill number 200601? If not... Would a clerk please call the next panel for bill number 200602? Paula Brumblow Burns. Good morning. I'm Paula Brumblow Burns, still a city planner at the Planning Commission. And I am here to testify on bill number 200602, which was introduced to the City Council on October 29th, 2020, by Council Member Gautier. Bill number 200602 amends the Philadelphia Zoning Code and MAPS by amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Zoning Code entitled Zoning and Planning by amending certain provisions of Chapter 14-500 entitled Overlay Zoning Districts by creating the TSO 30th Street Overlay District by revising certain provisions of Section 14-702 entitled Floor, Area, Height, and Housing Unit Density Bonuses and amending the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located with an area bounded by Chestnut Street, 30th Street, Walnut Street, and 31st Lower Level Street. The proposed bill concerns 119 South 31st Street, located in University City, close to 30th Street Station. The zoning bill's purpose is twofold, to change the base zoning of the parcel from I-2 Medium Industrial to CMX5 Center City Commercial Mixed Use, and to implement a mandatory affordable housing overlay. The base zoning change is in alignment with a number of recommendations from the Comprehensive Plan and the University Southwest District Plan. The affordable housing overlay for this parcel also speaks to Comprehensive Plan recommendations regarding increasing the supply of affordable housing. Planning Commission staff have had numerous conversations with City Council office staff regarding the drafting of the bill and PCPC staff concerns, mainly focused on utilizing applicant reported construction costs as a way to levy in lieu fees. We continue to work on an amended zoning bill in conjunction with the City Council office and LNI. PCPC staff is in support of a larger idea here of inclusionary zoning and increasing the city's supply of affordable housing. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered bill number 200602 at its meeting of November 17, 2020, and recommended the bill for approval with amendments that fine tunes the overlay text for affordable housing. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions and comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, is anyone else here to testify on bill number 200602? Hearing none, would a clerk please call the next panel for bill number 200604. Paula Brumblow Burns. Good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, City Planner with the Legislative Team of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on bill number 200604 which was introduced into City Council on October 29, 2020 by Council Member O'Neill. Bill number 200604 amends the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designation of certain areas of the land located within an area bounded by Byberry Road, Woodhaven Road, the Pequessing Creek, and adjacent land south of Franklin Mill Circle. The proposed bill concerns two parcels located at Woodhaven and Byberry Roads from RSA 1 residential single family attached 
to I-1 Light Industrial. These parcels are surrounded by Philadelphia Mills Mall, Woodhaven Road, and the Pequessing Creek. Roughly one third of this area is located in the FEMA floodway and roughly one half in the 100 year floodplain. After discussions with the council office, the council member agreed to amend this bill to change the zoning to ICMX industrial commercial mixed use. This zoning classification is consistent with the surrounding commercial area or commercial auto oriented districts, CA1 and CA2 zoning and would prohibit by right development of more intensive uses allowed in I-1 zoning, which is what was originally proposed. <coughs> the City Planning Commission at its meeting of November 17, 2020 recommended bill number 200604 for approval with amendments. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Councilman Brian O'Neill, would you like to make a comment on your bill? Yes, I, I'm fine with the amendment. I appreciate the Planning Commission working with me. Um, uh, there will probably be some deep restrictions between the uh, parties, uh, but um, they will be relatively minor. The, the main thing is this, this parcel does not, it's right adjacent to Franklin Mills. It's, a, it's, a, it's an odd piece of ground. They, the family that's been there for years, they used to have a business on their land, um, a nursery business. The parents are elderly. Uh, they've been having trouble for years trying to sell this property. And there's a um, there's an agreement of sale for a um, storage uh, unit type of business, and um, uh, it it is not not a problem for the community, but um, this will this will help. Uh, it is it is whether it's in I one or in IC, ICMX that uses is, is uh, permitted, and and I think it'll it's a It'll work for everyone, the community, the owners, and um, uh, we'll, we'll make it better considering what you have to go through with the zoning board these days uh, with COVID. And I'm, I'm on another call and in my other ear on a zoning case today where uh, it's all about continuances and the community not being able to participate and all that. So I think um, this is a, um, a good compromise and um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm okay with it. Okay. And I appreciate the, the chair's uh, Checking in. Thank you, Councilman O'Neill. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? All right. At this time, the committee will take a brief pause to allow members of the public who have registered for public comments on these particular bills to join a virtual meeting. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good. Hi. Good afternoon. How are you? My name is Modesto from good City thanks. Council. You've been called in. Uh, It'll be heated and air conditioned. Um, we believe the project will, will clean up a deteriorated property 
and provide lighting, landscaping, and security to the area. Um, the applicant is committed to continue to work uh, with the local uh, community and the councilman's office on this project. Uh, thanks for your consideration. Thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the next witness? That is the only witness for this bill. We will move on to the next bill and then call the public comment for that. Thank you very much, Brett. Do we need to take a break at this moment for, the, for Lonnie to set up? We will first hear the administration's testimony and then uh, Modesta will take a break and call the next couple uh, uh, individuals for public comment. All right, thank you very much. Okay. So uh, for bill number 200571, we have Paula Brumblow-Burns. Hello, I'm Paula Brumblow-Burns and I'm with the City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on bill number 200571, which was introduced into City Council on October 20th, 2020 by Council Member Parker for Council President Clark. Bill number 200571 amends the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain portions of land located with an area bounded by Diamond Street, 11th Street, North Street, and Marvine Street. The proposed bill will change the zoning designation from CMX3 commercial mixed use to RMX3 residential mixed use. This block is part of the Philadelphia Housing Authority's Norris Homes development. Philadelphia Housing Authority demolished the low-rise units that were on the site and has built replacement rental units on the southern two-thirds of the block. They have contracted with Frankel Enterprises to build 15 single-family homes on the northern one-third of the block that will be for sale to low to moderate income buyers. CMX3 does not permit single-family homes by right, and the zoning of RMX3 will permit all uses within the block. The rezoning will conform to the recommendations in the city's comprehensive plan. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number 200571 at its meeting of November 17, 2020, where recommendation was for approval of the bill. I will be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Any questions and comments from members of the committee? Okay, hearing none. At this time, the committee will take a brief pause to allow members of the public who have registered for public comment on this particular bill to join this virtual meeting. For public comment, the clerk will call your name and you will unmute yourself using star six. Once called, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Brenda Saka. Brenda, are you on? Hello? Hello? Yes. Uh, Who is this? It's Manny Delgado. Manny Delgado. Manny, can you please um, start with your testimony? Right now? Yes, you can be proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Council President Clark and Council members. I am Manny Delgado, Chief Operation Officer for APM. Uh, at APM, we've built over 250 affordable rental housing units and over 130 home ownership units in the Council President's District. Um, our last project was Paseo Verde, an LED, a LEED certified transit oriented development at Nathan Burks. So, on behalf of APM, I'm pleased to support Bill 200571. Uh, as we've worked extensively in this area to provide affordable rental and home ownership opportunities for the community, we support this bill because we see the critical need for workforce housing and hope that this change in zoning at 11th and Diamond will produce another development phase for the North Central Workforce Housing Project. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Delgado. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Donna Richardson. Donna, are you there? Hello. Hey, Donna. Yes. You can proceed with your testimony. Yes. Donna, you can proceed. Hello. Donna, can you hear me? Yeah. Who am I talking to? Councilman Kenyatta Johnson. You're in the Rules Committee hearing. 
Okay. Testifying for bill number 200571. Uh-huh. Would you like to proceed with your testimony? I'm sure. You can begin. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just stating that I was notified about the new homes coming up um, on the Diamond Street and also 8th and Burks. Also, the community was notified about the homes. I also had some of the residents that's in the NARS community who already went and applied for the homes online for them. So the community was well informed about the home ownership program, which is something that they really have wanted to it was to be able to buy homes in this very community. No, that's right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, you're, Donna. You're Anything welcome. Else? You're welcome. Have a blessed day. Would a you clerk too. please call, call the next witness? Brenda Sacco. And if you're still on the call, you can unmute yourself uh, by pressing star six. Brenda Sacco. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Two, six, seven, two, five, eight, four. Okay. I think we may have lost the connection with Brenda. And so we're going to move on to our next panel. Is there anyone else here to testify on this bill whose name has not yet been called? Hearing none, would a person. Please call the next panel for bill number 200654. Amanda Warwood. Good afternoon, Amanda. Uh, you are connected and ready to proceed. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Great, thank you so much. Good morning, uh, my name is Amanda Warwood. I serve as energy manager for the city of Philadelphia in the Office of Sustainability's Energy Office. So good morning, Chair Johnson and members of the committee. I'm here in support of bill number 200654, which authorizes the purchase of electricity, natural gas, and vehicle fuel for the city for its facilities to be delivered through fiscal year 2024. In 2010, Council authorized the city to make electricity purchases for fiscal 2011 through fiscal 2014. In 2012, Council extended that authorization to fiscal 2015 and has continued granting additional authorizations in subsequent years. Mayor Nutter issued Executive Order Number 6-10 creating an Electricity Supply Advisory Committee. The City Council Committee Chairs for Transportation and Utilities, Public Works and the Environment, or other or the representatives serve on the committee. The Electricity Supply Advisory Committee reviewed the electricity purchasing strategy and has been kept abreast of the purchases. The city's energy office serves as the primary manager of the procurement of electricity, natural gas and vehicle fuel for general aviation and water funds. The office's energy procurement work is guided by the city's municipal energy master plan and through conversations with the city's finance department, water department, and international airport. The energy office strives for the city's energy procurement to be low cost, to provide budget certainty, and to have transparent pricing, and to do so by increasingly using clean and renewable energy. The city government's electricity costs are significant and costs for all funds, general aviation and water, have been about $50 million over the previous three fiscal years. The cost of the general fund, including street lighting and signals for fiscal 2020 was 26 million. The electricity supply portion of the total bill is about two thirds of the total cost. Um, and the city has successfully manages, managed our supply costs by purchasing in the wholesale electricity market and staggering our purchases to limit the risk of paying a premium for electricity. The proposed ordinance would authorize the city to make agreements for delivery of electricity in fiscals 23 and 24 through a state regulated licensed service provider. The city's licensed service provider was selected through a competitive process and acts as the city's agent in making purchases in the regional electricity marketplace. The city's licensed service provider will serve as a key partner in the contract between the city, Philadelphia Energy Authority, and Adams Solar LLC as part of the solar power purchase agreement City Council approved in December of 2018. 
In addition to electricity purchases, the city purchases natural gas and vehicle fuel from the competitive market for its largest buildings and accounts. The city's interruptible natural gas accounts are those that can switch from natural gas to an alternative fuel whenever Philadelphia Gas Works PGW announces a temporary cur curtailment of gas service. The largest city buildings have accounts that qualify for access to the competitive market for natural gas supply. PGW is impartial of the city's approach to procurement as it is primarily compensated for delivery and distribution of natural gas, not for the supply portion. The city government's competitively purchased natural gas supply costs are significant and have cost um, for all city funds, general aviation and water. Um, they were approximately 3.5 million in fiscal 2020 and the cost to the general fund in particular was 1 million. The city government's vehicle fuel costs are also significant and costs for all funds, general aviation and water were about 13 million in fiscal 2020 and the cost of general fund for fiscal 2020 was 11 million. And for motor fuel, um, the city makes staggered purchases in the wholesale motor fuel market, providing the city with budget stability. The proposed ordinance would also authorize the city to make agreements for delivery of natural gas and vehicle fuel through fiscal year 24 with state and federally licensed providers. The current providers were selected through a competitive process and act as the city's agents in making purchases in energy markets. Building on a strong and growing relationship with the Philadelphia Energy Authority, the ordinance includes a provision that requires the administration to inform a designate, designated representative of the PEA of the city's intent to make the purchases and consider the timely advice provided by PEA on purchases. In closing, I anticipate that this procurement approach will continue to lower the city's electric, natural gas and motor fuel bills while protecting the city from potential escalation in energy prices over the next several years. It will contribute to competitive prices and budget certainty for the city's utilities, and it will also allow the city to continue to seek opportunities to increase its purchases of clean renewable energy through projects such as this Adam Solar Project. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony, Councilwoman Kathleen Gilmore Richardson. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and thank you, Amanda, uh, for your testimony. It's so wonderful to see you even virtually uh, and I'm very, very happy for you and proud of you. I just have a few questions. Uh, the first being um, for electricity, the procurement commissioner is authorized to enter into an agreement with the licensed supply provider who is then allowed to make electricity supply purchases only from the lowest bidder. Um, so has this limited your office's ability to, um, you know, take into account other considerations uh, specifically around the city's greenhouse, greenhouse uh, gas emission reduction goals? Thank you for the question, Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Um, good to see you virtually as well. So, we do not the supplier runs that process and so okay. they see the bids that come in um, they then um, they are sort of closed so we don't actually know what where those bids are coming in from in particular because we're primarily in that process concerned about the cost however you know i will say that the way that we procure electricity has allowed us to enter into a large solar power purchase agreement like the Adams Solar Project. And so um, that is a way that we can directly start to dictate where our electricity is coming from. And so that project um, accounts for about 25% of our electricity consumption. And you know our goal through the Municipal Energy Master Plan is to get to 100% renewable uh, electricity by 2030. So we're gonna be chipping away at that over the next 10 years to get us to 100%. Okay, excellent. And then around uh, the municipal energy dashboard, uh, the city's natural gas use remains uh, particularly high, uh, especially in the winter months. So what opportunities are you all exploring to kind of lower this usage? Um, that's a good question. You know, I will say um, if Christine Knapp is on the line also, um, I know that the broader Office of Sustainability has been doing some work with PGW as well. Um, but I, you know, generally I'll say um, we've been looking at projects, uh, 
focusing on some larger projects, but also smaller projects to um, get more efficient in our just overall energy usage. And, um, you know, we've done large projects in the quadplex buildings downtown um, to reduce what we would need to consume. So natural gas is typically heating our buildings in the winter. And so, um, however, we can look for the most efficient equipment. Um, that's something that we've done in our larger projects and some of our smaller projects as well. Um, so we're, we are looking you know, for projects and opportunities to upgrade equipment and make our buildings more efficient so that we, we ultimately use less natural gas. Excellent. And I'm just curious as to how all of that will change uh, in light of uh, our new virtual work from home environment, uh, particularly uh, this year. Um, I remember previously uh, when I was a legislative aide, uh, talk about um, potential replacement of the air conditioners in City Hall. And I think the return on investment was like 99 years or something. I don't know why that still uh, sticks out. So I was just curious about you know, how we're continuing to look at um, lowering all all of our usage, uh, particularly uh, in light of what's going on this year. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, can you just provide us an update uh, on the progress of the, the power purchase agreement and what other tools your office is currently evaluating, um, you know, to ensure that we, you know, meet the goals that have been laid out in the Municipal Energy Master Plan? Absolutely. So we're working on um, getting the Adam Solar project to commercial operation. We have hit some delays because of COVID uh, in that process, but we are actively working with the owner operator NG in that process to make sure that we get there um, in a timely manner as as their process can allow because of some delays that they've hit. Um, so we're we're working on that. And you know, I'll also just say that to get us to 100%, we're you know looking for these large purchases, but also opportunities for on-site projects as well. You know, okay, that's definitely an important piece of it. So we're going to be starting to look at um, what our opportunities there are and what buildings we can look at for for those kinds of projects too. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Amanda, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And just quickly, Mr. Chair, I have one last question I must get in around uh, electric vehicles because this is work that goes back some time. So I know the, the Office of Sustainability is you know, working on the clean fleet plan. Uh, so will we be able to see um, motor fuel savings up front if we begin actively transitioning the city fleet to electric vehicles? You know, when you talked about the natural gas and, and the agreements around the motor fuel, um, how are we looking at how we continue to transition our city's fleet to electric vehicles? Um, I'm going to call on Christine. Yeah, are you there? Hi. Hi, good morning, Councilwoman Neil Marcherson, uh, Christine Knapp, uh, Director of the Office of Sustainability. Um, yeah, you, you are correct. We are still working on um, a municipal clean fleet plan, which we hope to have um, out in the next couple of months. We've been working with fleet management and uh, other partners to look at um, you know, what the opportunities are to transition the city's fleet towards cleaner vehicles, particularly focusing on electric vehicles. Um, we do believe that there are cost savings that could be um, found, obviously, through using less fuel when we're talking about you know, moving to electricity. Um, but primarily, we're also seeing that there is um, there's a good amount of um, maintenance savings that can come mm -hmm. from using electric vehicles um, based on data from other cities. Um, there is, of course, an upfront investment. Um, some electric vehicles are cost neutral with um, regular gas powered cars. Some are more expensive, so that's something to consider. But it's really the infra infrastructure, the the charging infrastructure, that we have to also make that upfront investment. But there is, you know, eventually a return on that investment. So that's something that we'll capture, you know, through the data that we've collected from our own fleet, um, as well as from other cities, and we'll be able to share that within the master plan when when we issue that in the next couple of months. Okay, excellent. Well, I just wanted to thank you both um, for all of your work. You all are doing the hard work behind the scenes, uh, making it happen each and every day. And it's just been a pleasure to work with both of you. And I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Councilman Curtis Jones. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, out of our master plan and, and these types of requirements contracts, we've been blessed with low energy costs over the last, what, four years, correct? Both in the area of natural gas 
both in the areas of um, uh, of regular petroleum uh, gas. So were these a result of requirements, contracts that we locked into early and realized the savings? And are we still on that path to buy and lock in now that the prices are extremely low uh, before they take a surge up? What are, what are the trends? Exactly. Yeah, that's what we're seeing. Um, prices have really been coming down over the past few years, and that's why it's great that we have set up this way of procuring our energy so that we can um, lock into basically a hedge into the future for at you know at prices that we're seeing um, in their future prices that we're locking into, but they're affected by what's going on today in the market. So for example, you know, COVID has definitely had an impact on um, gasoline prices. And so because of the way that we can lock into the future for those prices, we've been able to capture some of that savings um, through the way that we buy energy. So can you provide to the chair what the charts have said in the past and are saying pointing to the future and what those savings actually are in real dollars so that as president of council and uh, this committee uh, prepare for the upcoming budgets, we kind of know what we're working with. Uh, that's that's number one. And then number two, have we entered into those triplex complex uh, contracts that says, you know, we're going to, we're going to reduce your energy consumption by recommending the following uh, energy savings and the, the savings will actually pay for the financing of the new windows. Have we been monitoring the results of those kinds of things and what, what have they been? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have been monitoring um, basically for the, the Quadflex project, for example, uh, we have, we're in a contract with that um, ESCO, who is Noresco, and um, they provide a guarantee that we will save more than what our utility costs would have been. So um, they provide an annual report every year showing that um, they come through every year, look at the installation, see how they're performing, uh, and then provide a guarantee saying that we are indeed saving what we should be. And so um, the energy office has also been working with our building operators though, in coordination with that to make sure that, you know, while the equipment is doing what it's supposed to be doing, that the building is being operated as it should be as well. And so we're just kind of helping them keep an eye out on what's happening in the building. Um, but the short answer is yes, we are, we are saving energy from that. So with the looming deficits that we're going to face next year, the finding quarters and pennies in the couch becomes something we as um, stewards of the budget have to do. So the, this information could be vital. And finally, uh, the city of Philadelphia has over 1,500 uh, electric uh, PICO accounts, 1,500. And we want to take a look at, um, and the largest consumption, Mr. Chair, comes out of the production of water in the city of Philadelphia as an expense to the city. Not the street lights, but the production of clean water. And so is there, uh, and, and now Mayor Kenny uh, was interested in a solar project dealing with water production on our process. Has there been any update on that kind of uh, uh, project for water reduction of electrical use? So I um, work in coordination with our energy program manager at the water department. I can certainly coordinate with her to provide some more information about the, the projects and programs that they have going on. Um, I know that they have, you know, uh, they have some goals. They have greenhouse gas emissions goals for their operations. Um, and they do have a solar installation at the Southeast uh, Water Pollution Control Plant. Um, but I'm happy to coordinate and get some more information on, you know, all the work that they have going on. Can you provide that to the chair of transportation and public utilities, please? Absolutely. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councilman Jones. Any other questions and comments of members of the committee? 
Thank you, Amanda, for your testimony. I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that at this time, the committee will take a brief pause to allow members of the public <coughs> who have registered for public comment on this particular bill to join us on this virtual meeting. the testament of those who have signed up for public comment. Will the clerk please call your name and you will unmute yourself using star six. Hello? Once all, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Clerk, clerk please call yeah. the first witness. Hello? Hi, um, you've been called to uh, testify for bill number uh, 200654. If you could just hold on, I will call each of your names to provide your public comment. Um, in the meantime, please mute yourself if your name is not called. So uh, the first name we have testifying at the Rules Committee for bill number 200654 is Marta Gutenberg. Marta, are you there? And you can press star six to unmute yourself. I believe this, I have unmuted myself. Yes, you did, Marta. Thank you. Please proceed you. with the testimony. Thank you. My name is Marta Guttenberg. I live in Center City, Philadelphia. I'm speaking today on behalf of the environment and the future as people consider energy use and fuel use for the city. I do see a lot of waste in how fuel is used in the city, particularly gasoline in vehicles that are city operated. In my opinion, the most egregious waste is uh, by the police department. I've seen um, inappropriate use, such as a big marine, the big marine police vehicle <clears throat> driving down Walnut Street, stopping in the middle of the street with the um, all its lights blaring and, uh, of course, the motor running while the driver goes into a cigar store and comes out um, and gets back in, into the car distributing cigars to <clears throat> a fellow um, patrolman uh, on the way, uh, causing a, a traffic jam. Um, I see police vehicles being used really as stop signs around um, construction sites um, with the, 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 the lights flashing, motor running. And uh, it seems to me that that use of gasoline could be taken up even by a, a flashing stop sign or um, during the daytime, at least, a person standing, a, a flag man standing there and waving the traffic on. Um, uh, I, my opinion is that even the way police patrols are done is a waste of gasoline. What I see is policemen sitting in their cars on their cell phones, um, motor running, uh, air conditioning running, um, lights usually off um they're they're not patrolling but they are burning fuel and despoiling the air with uh emissions um i i, I think i'll stop there um, i'm sure people will talk about other uh kinds of fuel wastage thank you for letting me uh speak thank you very much Ms. Marta Guttenberg, would a clerk please call the next witness? Walter Sow, um, and if you are muted, you can press star six. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, Walter. Just state your name for the record and please proceed Hi, can you with your hear testimony. Me? Yes, we can hear you, Walter. Hi. Uh, well, uh, 
Thank you, Councilman Johnson and members of the Rules Committee. My name is Dr. Walter Tsu. I'm a, with Physicians for Social Responsibility based here in Philadelphia. I wish to speak on this bill 200654. And while it seems like a routine purchase agreement for electricity, natural gas, and motor fuel for the least the next three years, I believe this offers us an opportunity to advance the mayor's goal of 80% clean renewable energy by the year 2050. This offers us an opportunity to rethink the two major energy purchases, electricity and natural gas for Philadelphia. Consider PICO our major electricity supplier for the region. For the next five years, PICO lobbied heavily for their default service plan, which defines the energy sources for their electricity to only include 0.5% solar until 2025. Numerous environmental groups asked for a minimum of 10% solar, although they refused. This is a profound implications for Philadelphia since, and I'm glad to see Christine Knapps here, on their document, Powering Our Future, a Clean Energy Future Vision for Philadelphia, shows that nearly 50% of the city's effort to reach this 80% goal by 2050 depends on choosing a clean electricity supplier. Now here's the second major energy source, natural gas, which is primarily methane, a potent greenhouse gas. Philadelphia owns PGW, which in the era of climate change is becoming an albatross around the neck of the city. Let's suspend judgment for a moment to think outside of the box and imagine what would it mean if PGW was recreated as a clean energy supplier for Philadelphia, encouraged by this purchase agreement from the city to aid in that transition. It's clear that PICO, at least for the next five years, will be unable to be that clean energy supplier. But PGW, perhaps through community geothermal, electric heat pumps, induction stoves, electric charging stations across the city, and maybe more solar and wind energy agreements, could be that clean energy supplier. Already, Philadelphia will be powering, as you know, 22% of its city buildings through its 80 megawatt clean energy uh, program in Adams County. In short, the city's purchasing agreement can benefit PGW in its transition to be a clean energy energy supplier for the city. Transitioning our buildings away from gas heat will take another 30 years, but we need to be thinking now. Every energy purchase we make should be directed tr toward moving us toward electrification, including electric vehicles and new building construction. This is clearly a bigger discussion than what we have time for. But we need to do our part as a city to achieve its 2050 goals and reduce the risk from climate change. And we can begin starting with this purchase agreement. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, Walter. Can the clerk please call the next witness? Logan Wheel. And you can unmute yourself using star six. Hi, this is Logan Weldy from Clean Air Council. Good morning to all you city council members and guests. Um, I wanted to reiterate what both the first speakers said. You know, the city has made a commitment to reducing its greenhouse gases and every single purchase that we make from here on out has got to reflect that. You can't just turn on a dime when you're doing things like this. You've got to prepare and you've got to start preparing now for the future. All the electric vehicles are gonna be coming into the city and we've got zero preparation for that. The one bill that we had in Philadelphia that, that encouraged electric vehicles was killed a few years ago and there's been no replacement. What, what Martha spoke about was idling. The Clean Air Council has documented thousands of city vehicles that idle in the city. Once you purchase that gasoline, there's no way to trace which vehicles are using it. Every single vehicle in this city that the city owns is idling right now. I almost guarantee it. We have videos of drivers who say that they have zero knowledge of the law. It's a city law that you're not allowed to idle. The Clean Air Council calculated in the two years that we did this study, the city wasted $6 million on fuel for those city's vehicles. There's got to be a way that you guys step up and take responsibility for the idling vehicles in the city. You're wasting taxpayers' dollars and you're polluting the air at the same time. 
the the emissions from the vehicles are 30 percent more toxic when they idle than when they're just being driven so you are really polluting the the poorest people in the city because many of the vehicles sit in in neighborhoods that are uh low income and and disadvantaged communities already so if you've got any questions i'd be happy to answer them and if you check out idle free philly you can see all of the reports that we have for city vehicles thanks thank you very much for your testimony is there anyone else here to testify on this bill whose name has not been called hearing none would a clerk please call the next panel for bill number two zero zero six one three paula brumblow bird Good morning, members of the Rules Committee. I am Paula Brumblow Burns, City Planner with the Legislative Team of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. I am here to testify on Bill Number 200613, which was introduced into City Council on November 12, 2020, by Council Member Parker on behalf of Council President Clark. Bill Number 200613 amends the Philadelphia Zoning Code by creating the Strawberry Mansion Neighborhood Conservation Overlay. The proposed bill will create a new zoning overlay that ensures that new construction matches the size and scale of existing homes within the neighborhood. The area of the NCO will fall within 33rd Street, Oxford Street, 29th Street, and Dauphin Street. The bill includes zoning regulations, which the Department of License and Inspections will administer, and design regulations, which PCPC will administer. The overlay will only apply to residential properties and properties zoned residential. Staff has worked with the Strawberry Mansion Coalition and the Council President's Office. At the meeting, there was a hot at our Planning Commission meeting. There was a high level of public participation on both sides of the issues, and an additional public meeting within the community was requested. The Planning Commission will be hosting a public meeting on November seventh, and the community has had three open meetings. The Philadelphia City Planning Commission considered Bill Number Two Zero Zero Six One Three at its meeting of November seventeenth. 2020 and recommended that it have an additional 45 days for review. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Councilman, Council President Daryl Clark. One second. Mr. Chairman, I do not believe um, that the council president is still on the call. Did you want to move forward with public comments? Well, he would like to uh, make okay. comments regarding his bill. So I did notify him Okay. and want to give him an opportunity to speak on his bill. Council president's calling in now. Thank you, Councilman Squiller. Council President Darrell Clark, you are here to speak on your bill. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and colleagues and members and, and members listening. Uh, real brief, uh, sorry for being delayed. It was on another Zoom call. Um, basically, I just want to say that uh, first, I want to thank the uh, local community uh, in the Strawberry Mansion neighborhood. And as you all know, I talk about it all the time. I have a deep history, uh, personal history with this particular community um, and have an affinity for it. I'm not going to, you know, apologize for that. But the reality is, is that it is a community that's, that's steeped in history. And the reality is, is that that particular community came to me um, several months ago uh, voicing some concerns about some of the changes 
uh, both that they were seeing in, in anticipation based on the number of properties that were being purchased, I believe at sheriff sale or direct sale. And it was a real concern about uh, protecting the character, uh, preserving the history of that particular community. And I recommended that they meet with the planning commission and they did that. Uh, they followed the traditional protocol and they worked well with the planning commission uh, to come up what we believe to be a reasonable approach to preservation. Um, um, not knowing some of the things that were going on on the other side, uh, we saw developments popping up um, inconsistent with the character of that neighborhood. No notification, uh, literally 38, some cases, higher buildings popping up in the middle of nowhere with, with no interaction with the local, very strong community organizations, uh, the CDC and the Civic Association and the Neighborhood Action Committee and it was real concern. So uh, they crafted uh, what we believe was to be a, a good bill of uh, going through the process. Um, so I just want to say I support this extremely strong. Um, I understand that there is some opposition uh, without getting personal. I do want to say I have real concerns that uh, individuals think uh, just because they have enough money or the resources to purchase land uh, in neighborhoods, uh, vacant properties, that somehow uh, their perspective on the view of what that community should be supersedes the perspective of people that have lived there all their lives. And I can tell you that these people have lived there all their lives and they understand that community. They understand what they want. So I'm, uh, I'm requesting uh, in, in, in a very humble way uh, that uh, my colleagues on the council, uh, on the committee, uh, strongly consider uh, the community's wishes to allow um, for that community and not uh, people who, who are not necessarily um, have the history and, and the perspective on that community be the ones that determine the future of that particular neighborhood. So Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you very much for indulging me uh, briefly. And thank you to, to the colleagues and members um, on, the, on the committee. You're thank welcome, you, Council. You're welcome, Council President. Any questions and comments to members of the committee? Hearing none, at this time, the committee will take a brief pause to allow members of the public who have registered for public comment on this particular bill to join us during this virtual meeting. And just so all of council is aware, uh, uh, council support will be calling in groups of six. So we will have multiple groups and there will be a couple pauses in between um, the calling of the constituents. Hello. Hello. Hello, Logan. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Hey. Um, oh, hi, this is Logan. Hi, you've been called into the city council due to you have uh, your schedule for public testimony. Um, yes. Still waiting for a few more participants to join. You're actually in a group call, but we ask if you can please uh, move your phones by hitting star six until your name is called. Thank you. So, so hit star six now, or hit star yes. six when my name is called. Star six now, and to unmute, you can hit star six again. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Hi, good, Hello? Hi, good morning. How are you? You've been called into the city council hearing. You are scheduled for public Okay, it looks like we're ready. 
to my office and we will distribute it to committee members. And that written testimony can be sent to brett.uniform at filler.gov. That's B R E T T dot N E D E L O K N O F F at filler.gov. We have a significant amount of individuals who have signed up for public testimony. So I would like you also to um, get to your point summarize but also um, make your statement with clarity but also briefness as well because we have a significant amount of people that will also like to um, add their testimony. With that being said, would a clerk please call the first witness. And to reiterate, once your name is called, you can press star six to unmute. If you are watching the hearing um, on your computer or television, please either turn it off or mute it because it can cause feedback. Um, so the first name to comment on bill number 200613 is Kevin Matheson. Hey. You can state your name and proceed with your testimony. Hey, how are you? My name is Kevin Matheson. And uh, I, uh, I would just like to say that, you know, this is an anti-development bill. And based on, you know, the, the time I've spent in the meetings, um, there, there's a great divide, and I think you know we need to we need to work together uh, as opposed to uh, what's what's happening here is just you know it's it's a lot of back and forth um, and and adversarial and it, and it, and it really does not need to be that way. I think everyone can work together, and you know we need to discuss um, you know how we can make Strawberry Mansion better. Um, and continue to see its growth. Um, you know, I, I have uh, been in this neighborhood since 2012. Um, you know, I've renovated over 70 properties um, but as as a private developer. That's not, you know, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a huge group. I'm not anything other than, you know, a single private developer. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm out in the field, um, but. Uh, you know, that was a lot of these properties that I purchased too, you know, they were all uh, PHA owned and dilapidated. Um, you know, PHA could not uh, upkeep these properties, you know, so they, they went up for sale. Everyone was was able to uh, to go to these auctions or, or, or look at them, you know, on the market. And, and it was it was free market. This is a free economy. We live in the U.S. And, you know, it, that that's what it was. And each and every property. I love the, the architecture and everything. And just, you know, seeing the improvement that's happened is now there's new interest and new developers coming in. Um, you know, we, we don't want developers to come in and steamroll over this neighborhood. That's not the intention. Uh, but we do want to work together. We want to work together with the community. And, you know, there's a great divide that we've identified here. And, you know, just want to use this as an opportunity to work together. So that that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you very much. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Logan Kramer. And if you're muted, you can press star six to unmute. Logan Kramer. Logan, are you there? Unmute yourself by pressing star six. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Tanetta Graham. Tanetta Graham. Good morning. Can you hear me? Sorry, I was having technical difficulties. I mean, this is Tanetta okay. Graham. So, okay. Tanetta, give me right. one second. Tanetta, give me one second. We have someone um, prior to you. So, if you could just mute yourself, and then we will call you right after this gentleman gives his testimony. So, you can proceed you. with your testimony. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Chairman um, and Councilmen and Councilwomen. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. 
I uh, want to start with one of my favorite quotes from one of my heroes, the uh, late Congressman John Robert Lewis. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up, you have to say something, you have to do something. And I feel that this bill is a massive anti-small business and anti-development bill. And as a small business owner, it's been in a, a very, very tough time through um, this uh, COVID crisis. And I feel that this business, sorry, this bill is just going to be pushing out businesses and pushing out uh, development. The city already is in a $700 million deficit. Um, uh, my development uh, company that's a small business in Brewerytown is uh, looking to build over here 300 affordable and moderate income units that would uh, be targeted towards renters making between thirty dollars to $50,000 a year. And um, this bill would stop that and it would stop close to about $3 million of tax revenue that would help go into the city fund, as well as it would uh, create a great uh, environment and neighborhood. I think the largest issues surrounding Strawberry Mansion are gun violence, poverty, lack of affordable housing, increased crime. And I also feel that this bill is a policy that is uh, supporting exclusionary zoning. And I believe that the city is trying to support inclusionary zoning. And I feel that this bill is the exact opposite of what the city needs. And um, I feel that I can speak as a, as a builder that this will increase my building cost by close to $200,000 per home, which is going to just further um, affordability issues in the city. And um, there's just going to be very little development here and just going to further blight, further crime, further a bunch of issues here. And we definitely want to see a compromise. Um, I've definitely reached out to the Strawberry Mansion CDC. Uh, we had a meeting last night, and I just feel that we all need more time with this bill. Um, this has been rushed. I've tried to reach out to Councilman Clark's office to work to compromise with this bill, um, and they've not been willing to compromise, as well as the Strawberry Mansion CDC. And I just want to work together, as I feel that um, there was very little public notice. There's 23,000 residents in Strawberry Mansion, and only about 10 to 15 residents were aware of this bill. Um, I was on a Zoom call last night. There was about 40 of us, and it was about close to 20 to 30 people that I brought there and just a, a few uh, residents. And I just feel that this bill is half-baked. It needs more time for negotiations, more time with the community. I definitely support the idea of preserving architectural character when it is uh, reasonably affordable to do so. Um, and I support the mission, but I just think that the legislation itself needs to, to be uh, massively changed and we need some time for a compromise. Um, I know that this bill is even amended around 9.30 in the morning and no one's had a chance to see these amendments. And uh, this is an honorable board. And um, I just don't think that it's honorable to be um, trying to pass rules on a bill that no one has even seen the amendments on. And the other legal aspect of this bill is that uh, there's two NCO requirements this does not meet. Um, one NCO requirement is that uh, it is the maximum size is 25 blocks. This bill is uh, covering over 70 blocks. Um, they tried breaking it up into three zones, which in my opinion is not legal. But the bigger thing is that in all three zones that they broke this up into, there's uh, in zone one, 22% vacant land, zone two, 23% vacant land, and zone three, 24% vacant land. And uh, if there's over 20%, an NCO is not valid. So this bill has no legal validity. Thank you. And uh, I just would appreciate if we could have more time on this matter and um, come up with a, a compromise. I'm all for working together. I'm all about unity. And I just feel that we all need um, all stakeholders table um, in a proper process and not a bill that's kind of rushed and half-baked. Thank you so much for your time and have a blessed day. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Tanetta Graham. Good morning. This is Tanetta Graham. Good morning. You can state your name for the record and begin. Tanetta Graham. You can start your testimony, Tanetta. All right. Thank you. Imagine sleeping in your single family home that you owned deed in hand for 40 years and being awakened by the sound of construction vehicles digging a hole in a lot that's been adjacent to your house for 15 years. You approach the, the crew and make inquiries about their plans. They seem to not understand your request, 
and direct you to work to the work permits and building approvals for construction of a new multi-unit building. Who owns this development? What type of building are they constructing, you ask? The posted documents list ownership as an LLC whose name and address is the address of the parcel. So you direct your inquiry to a block captain who is also perplexed, but puts you in touch with the Strawberry Mansion CDC. The CDC learns through investigation that it's a buy right project. And that begins the arduous process of locating the true property owner to get a rendering of the building and a reliable contact in case the homeowner's property gets damaged during the project. Meanwhile, the mystery continues for the homeowner as they sit and wait to see what type of building gets erected. This has become an all too familiar scenario in Strawberry Mansion. As president and lifelong resident of Strawberry Mansion CDC, we are inundated with calls from long-term homeowners who are extremely concerned that they are being inundated with buy-right developments that take no heed to the current housing stock and its brick facade, porches in many cases, windows and roof lines. Many of these buy-right projects read as they do in our neighboring communities. The standard, 38 feet with a rooftop deck and vinyl facade. They're trying to make our neighborhood look like Legoland. These designs don't match the aesthetics of our block. These are just a few of the complaints the Strawberry Mansion CDC hears from homeowners who are puzzled by why someone would build a house with protruding bay windows on a block with 100% flat window lines. They are messing up the look of our neighborhood, is what we constantly hear. The housing stock in Strawberry Mansion consists of brownstones, brick masonry, ornate cornices, porches, and a flowing mixture of two- and three-story row houses. Blocks of two-story worksman houses line numerous blocks some of which are made of the same beige or red brick manufactured here in Philadelphia. Picturesque porch line blocks are characteristic of Strawberry Mansion, an established community that is 90% African-American. Our home ownership rate hovers at 44%, which is notable for a community labeled as low wealth. Our homes are old, and we lost many due to the Neighborhood Transformation Initiative, MTI. Nevertheless, they are owned by residents who have raised generations of their families. The character of our housing stock is notable, and it's currently under assault by the buy right zoning option, which affords developers the right to build with little to no input from the community. Our mission states the SMCDC was established to promote sustainable development and preserve the historical character of our well-documented housing stock of brownstones and two- and three-story row houses. Since 2004, we've worked diligently to preserve our African-American home ownership rate, along with our aging housing stock. Within our boundaries are hundreds of vacant parcels that the community wants to be filled with the appropriate balance of affordable and market rate units for home ownership and rental. We are tasked by our residents to promote projects that are the best fit for our area and those that preserve the character of our community. Our most impactful neighborhood housing uh, preservation initiative occurred recently with the Strawberry Mansion Historic Home Repair Program a neighborhood pilot program funded primarily with a $1.5 million, million dollar grant from the William Penn Foundation. This pilot aims to provide needed interior repairs and preserve the historic exterior characteristics of the homes for 25 long-term homeowners. This grant is unprecedented in a low wealth neighborhood like Strawberry Mansion, and its value has grown close to $2 million with additional funding and expertise from List Philadelphia, PHDC's Basic System Repairs, Habitat for Humanity, Pen Praxis, the Preservation Alliance, and the 1772 Foundation. We are excited that these organizations respect and understand the value of preservation in Strawberry Mansion. The Strawberry Mansion CDC and other CBOs are working diligently to stabilize and preserve our homes, avoid displacement, and support projects that are best fit for our neighborhood. But we are continually challenged by development interests that don't align with our preservation goals. As the buy right zoning option has threatened the continuity of the housing stock in our community, a coalition of block captains, RCOs, concerned residents, and community-based organizations sought relief to preserve the character of our community. We thoroughly researched overlays from various communities, drafted this legislation, and worked with the Planning Commission and our local and state elected officials to ensure its legality and to solidify our voice in the preservation and the continuity of our housing stock. Well, the audacity of this African-American community to seek to preserve what we know as Strawberry Mansion. The audacity of this low wealth community to use this overlay tool that has helped preserve more affluent Philadelphia communities like Queen Village, Powelton, and Roxborough. 
the audacity of an established community to disrupt the buy right plans of developers who have admittedly devised neighborhood plans without the current neighbors who are, by the way, homeowners. The audacity of this community to seek to preserve the character of their neighborhood by foregoing height and density bonuses and rejecting building designs that disrupt the continuity of the housing stock. Yes, it's audacity. It's mansion's audacity, resilience, and rights as homeowners and citizens. We, do, we did the work. Now we ask for your support to strengthen our voice by advancing this legislation. Thank you, Councilwoman Parker, for introducing this bill on behalf of City Council President Dal Clark and to you both for your audacity and honoring our work and supporting our goal to preserve Strawberry Mansion as we know it. Thank you for your time and care in considering the passage of this legislation. Thank you very much. With a quick call the next witness. Charles Lanier and press star six to mute. Charles Lanier. Charles, are you there? Press star six to unmute yourself. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Diane Davis. Yes. Hello, Diane. Can you please state your name for the record? You can begin your testimony. Yes, good morning, Council President and City Council members. My name is Diane Davis, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am a homeowner, registered voter, living in Strawberry Mansion. I've been a resident for over 65 years. My parents purchased our family home in 1958. Neighbors were also homeowners because and became part of our extended family. We had and still have pride in our community because we owned a piece of it. That pride doesn't always extend to those who live in apartment buildings where maintenance is someone else's responsibility. Therefore, I ask, we want to see more affordable housing in Strawberry Mansion where residents have an opportunity to eventually own the property, not necessarily residents living in apartment buildings where the owner's only concern is how much income they generate. We were once a thriving family community where every available service was within walking distance. We had grocery stores, barber shops, clothing. Not a community overrun with apartment buildings such as these developers want to impose on us. And yes, we have homes that need repairs. Yes, there are empty lots in our community, but that is a part of the gentrification effort, which in turn gives these developers the opportunity to come in and acquire parcels at an unbelievable rate, an unbelievable price. I'm not anti-development. I'm not against development. But if these developers really want what's best for Strawberry Mansion, why not work with us to make our community what it once was? We were once a we are a neighborhood of homeowners that once won awards from Model Cities program for having some of the most beautiful blocks. The homes purchased years ago Hello? have been passed generation. Hello? have been passed down from generation to generation, from children to grandchildren. There are seniors who worked hard to acquire and maintain, and I know this to be true because I'm one of those seniors. So I ask you, council members, to support our efforts, support our legislation. And before developers come in adding apartment buildings, instead of adding affordable housing, they sit down. And this legislation will allow them to sit down, listen to the homeowners who presently live in Strawberry Mansion. We only ask transparency by our developers and truthfulness. Thank you for your time and listening to my story. Thank you. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Austin, you can press star six to unmute. Oscar Bizert. And is Charles Lanier on the call? Press star six to unmute. Is 
Mr. Chairman, that is it for the uh, first group. Um, we can try the individuals who might have been having technical difficulties again in a later group, but um, we will give council support another couple moments to call in the next group of um, public comment. Giving testimony in a moment. Can you please put your phone on mute? Start press by pressing star six. Hello. Just a note to all the callers on mute. I will go through and call your name one by one and you'll be your testimony. Um, while you're waiting, please keep your phone muted so there's no feedback. And if you have a, a hearing playing in the background, please mute that as well because it can cause additional feedback. So the first name is Margot Viola. You can press star to unmute. Hey, babe. Maybe a hot dog with a hamburger? Mr. Chairman, you are not muted. I just noticed that. <laughs> well, what okay. a clerk, please. What a clerk, please. <laughs> clerk, please call. Yeah. The next witness, um, please. Margo Viola, please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, members of the Rules Committee. Thank you for your time this morning. My name is Margo Viola, and I'm a resident of Brewery Town and an investor in. Strawberry Mansion rehab properties for the last four years. Uh, I've personally rehabbed over a dozen properties and every single one has started as an abandoned shell. They have all, I now have a handful of lots that I'm looking to put into development. Now we have great relationships with every neighbor in, in right next to our properties. And that's because we respect them. We care about this community. They have personally been thrilled with the development because they've previously dealt with the repercussions of living next to a shell. Two of them were formerly drug dens, one had squatters, and, and two of them were next to lots that became dumping grounds, and we've since cleaned them up. I'm supportive of the underlying intent of this bill to preserve the character of the neighborhood and align on a unified approach that serves the residents and those investing in the neighborhood, but I am not supportive of the rules as they are written because I don't believe that they achieve these goals and actually negatively impact the very people this is supposed to protect. As far as the legality of the proposed, you know, NCO, it's 
specified neighbors or community group that initiates the project process must provide proof of interest by 30% of affected property owners. There's been two CDC meetings. One was last night. There was one public post on their Facebook page on November 9th about the initial CDC meeting. There have been no flyers, no emails, no notice provided to my personal block captains and have seen no signatures in support of this bill. I, I've personally been visiting the CDC website and there has not been a single mention of these meetings. So I feel very strongly that we do not have a demonstrated proof of support behind this. Number two, as mentioned, the proposed amendment to the bill was shared for, with me last night at 6 p.m. There may have been another one this morning. Number three, this should only be, you know, proposed NCO can only be 25 blocks. As we know, Strawberry Mansion is upwards of 70. So we, the, the committee has simply proposed three different zones. Feels like a very clear subversion of the purpose and the integrity of an NCO. And lastly, there's supposed to be no more than 20% of land containing vacant lawns. If you drive around, you know, generously, I could say it's 25%, 30%. We haven't been provided the exact data. I believe this needs to be shared and validated before this should ever be brought to the rules committee. So to conclude, and I will try and wrap it up, this bill has huge implications for the future of Strawberry Mansion. I feel a much more significant effort needs to be invested and shown to demonstrate that 30% of property owners are interested in this and that the rules as written are in line with the intent of the bill. I believe a primary goal is to empower residents to participate in the neighborhood and development and benefit from the increase in the value of their properties. And I propose a much greater focus on education around things like the homestead exemption, buying from the land bank and other programs that are meant to support residents to gain equity and value in their homes and increase ownership. Um, so I do hope that this is not passed today and, and, and that there is more time for a true discussion between all parties to come to a much more comprehensive bill that actually lives up to the, you know, intent behind it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Wayne M. King, and you can press star six to unmute. Wayne, are you there? Wayne, can you press star six if you're there? Would a clerk please call the next witness? Drew Miller. Drew Miller, you can press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we Hello. Are. Yes, we can okay, hear you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Miller. Uh, I'm I'm a constituent of President Clark's. Uh, I've, I'm calling to support uh, this this overlay bill uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm I'm a member of, uh, and stakeholder and active resident in the Fishtown neighborhood, a different neighborhood, and so I have actually seen the effects of not having an overlay like this in place. Over the past 12 years in Fishtown, there's been a, a lot of development. I won't go into all that because that's not 100% relevant. Uh, but all of that's been discussed thoroughly at the committee on L&I hearings that were held in on February 21st earlier this year. Um, I, I think I think one of the important factors of an overlay like this, as has already been mentioned uh, by Tanetta Graham, is carefully working with developers to have development move in a way that is supportive of the neighborhood rather than adversarial of the neighborhood. Uh, history is one, of, is one of Philadelphia as a whole's greatest assets and one of the greatest uh, pieces of value that a neighborhood has. As you can see, the neighborhoods with the most history in our city are often some of the most uh, financially uh, upper class and also the most visited and supported by the broader community beyond Philadelphia. Uh, and, and as was mentioned before, Queens Village has been able to utilize an overlay similar to this uh, to uphold its historic nature. And I think it's a matter of racial equity and just equity in general uh, 
to a- allow a neighborhood such as Strawberry Mansion to do the same. Uh, th- I mean, I, one of the other important things that I think, uh, and this overlay will do, is is create the avenues for which discussions uh, that can encourage a community benefit agreements, both for larger projects uh, in in concert with Strawberry Mansion, but also so for the smaller infill projects, which are often the most overlooked. And are often the ones that that take homeowners by surprise uh, when when there's no notification until someone's underpinning their home. Uh, in in Fishtown, there's been collapses caused by things like this. That that I think this kind of oversight by the neighborhood will easily uh, prevent. Uh, development is is exciting and important, and I'm glad that that so many people are interested in developing Strawberry Mansion. Uh, it's it's has a beautiful history, as has been discussed. And I think it's important that the development be moved through in a respectful way for the neighbors and the neighborhood uh, so that both the developers can seek their investment and and benefit from their investment, but that also the neighborhood and the neighbors can also benefit from the lifting up of their neighborhood. Uh, And and I think this, this will create that situation and there, there will be discussion back and forth from the different parties that, that, have various investments or concerns on this matter. Uh, and, and I think it'll both support development and support the existing neighborhood. Uh, we just need to set up the procedures so that all interested parties can properly work together, uh, both the ones that are well-funded financially and those that are not. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. With a quick call the next witness, Bonita Cummings, press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Yes, Bonita, you can start your testimony. Hi. How are you today? Uh, good Going morning, good. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Council Members, Planning Commission. My name is Bonita Cummings, and I am the Director of Strawberry Mansion Community Concerns. On November 12, 2020, Bill number 2613 was introduced, and before the ink could even make it to the paper, the Strawberry Mansion community was attacked by developers through verbal threats, intimidation, and condescension. Through these developers' blatant actions, we learned as the issue of racism again rose up its ugly head that we were two-thirds human had the brains of a pea, and black women did not possess the capacity to be involved in drafting a bill of such legal needs. You will or have heard how counterintuitive the bill appears, but what you won't hear from the developers is how the greatest transference of wealth in Strawberry Mansion through serve sell, theft, flipping properties, wholesaling, et cetera, took place. There are two to three non-African-American developers who have confiscated 1,000 parcels of property and land, particularly Logan Kramer. And Logan Kramer has gone on record stating that he has 300 parcels. And Josefina, who has also gone on record stating that he has 200 to 300 parcels of projects in quarter acres, half acres, whole acres, et cetera, ready to go. How could this massive transference of land have gone unchecked? Because no one in the Strawberry Mansion community was even made aware from the developers that this was happening. Therefore, the Strawberry Mansion community has no rights or governing laws that the developers have to respect. This type of overlay is all over the city and various neighborhoods, yet it is being significantly challenged for Strawberry Mansion. Therefore, we ask this body, city council, to not weigh on the side that we are less human, to not weigh on the side that we should be poor blacks in Strawberry Mansion, to not weigh on the side that we should be the strange fruit dangling, hanging from our necks from their rooftop deck, and to not weigh on the side that we should merely acquiesce to the will of these developers who have no interest in Strawberry Mansion outside of making a quick process. Give bill number 200 the opportunity to work 
as we, the Strawberry Mansion community, can work on planning for our community, have wealth creation like others, because we are a responsible community. And without Bill 200-613, we will be steamrolled over. There will be no communication. There will be no respect like it has not been already. And when we look up, we will have no say, and we will be boxed in our community with no opportunity for our own wealth creation, any heritage passing of our own property. So we do ask this committee to um, support our uh, to support Bill 200 and we thank you um, for not taking our voice and allowing us, the Strawberry Mansion community, to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Will a quick call the next witness? Mary Felder, press star six to unmute. Mary Felder. Mary, press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? We hear you now. Okay. Good morning. My name is Mary Felder. I'm a registered voter, longtime homeowner in the Strawberry Mansion section. I do support, support the overlay of bill number 20613. Hello. Ms. Felder, we can hear you. Um, did you want to continue with your testimony or is, are you finished? Mm, I'm finished. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Want to quick call the next witness? Is Wayne King on? You can press star to unmute yourself. Wayne, are you there? Mr. Chairman, that is the last name for this group. We will give council support um, another pause to call in the last group of names. Thank you very much, Brett.
ready. So um, just a note for all those who have been called in for public comment and are on hold, um, we've asked you to press star six to mute yourself so there is no feedback while the others are testifying. When your name is called, you can press star six again and that will unmute you and you can begin your testimony. If you are listening to the hearing on another platform in the background, whether it's TV or your laptop, please mute it while you are testifying so there is no feedback. Thank you. Um, the first name is Charles Lanier. Charles Lanier, please press star six to unmute yourself. Oh. Hello, Mr. Lanier. Charles, are you there? I'm trying to be, am I here? Can you, anybody hear me? Yeah, we Can hear you. Hear me? Please proceed with your testimony, oh. Charles. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, good morning. Morning. Okay, am I on? Good morning. I'm thank, thank you, thank you. I've been trying to get on. I'm sorry for the, uh, the technical challenge here, but I'm calling in behalf of support testimony in support of Bill two zero zero six one three on behalf of the Story Management Development Corporation Co Coalition. My name is Charles Lanier. I'm the board president of the Strawberry Mansion Neighborhood Action Center. I like to give you a quote. There is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. From public housing to home ownership, my family moved to Strawberry Mansion in 1958. A community rich with homeowners, small businesses of color, character, diversity, clean, with respect for neighborhoods and families. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we saw an elimination of leadership, influx of drugs, guns, alcohol, and flight leaving urban blight, impacting the mental and physical health of our community. We are still victims, uh, uh, we are still being held hostage. Benign neglect, an attitude or policy of ignoring an often delicate or undesirable situation that one is held to be responsible for dealing with, allowing for the abandonment of urban neighborhoods, the deliberate withdrawal of civil city services, to blighted neighborhoods as a means of coping with dwindling tax revenues. Surrey Manager has been a victim of this. We are now faced with the challenge of ensuring that our community, Strawberry Mansion, stops the non-neglect, stop the cancer. We are faced with the challenge of being pushed out of our community. We are faced with the challenge of preserving housing versus transitional housing. We are fighting to preserve a rich history with historical values preserving family, preserving character. We are a community that cares. We are a coalition of not only residents, but a coalition of professionals. We are asking for respect, not only as a community, but, but as professional organizations, inclusive of the Story Mansion Community Development Corporation, Story Mansion Neighborhood Action Center, the Story Mansion Neighborhood Advisory uh, a subcommittee, the RCOs, and others representing the Strawberry Mansion Development Corporation. We are not opposed to development. We are 100% in support of development. Community economic development means just that. Development by the community, not for the community. We must be able, we have to be at the table, not after the fact. We must be included in the plans for our community. As we move forward in the ongoing development of Strawberry Mansion, there must be sustainable partnership agreements. We, as we continue to build, we must be assured that home ownership is a priority, housing preservation is an achievable goal. The Strawberry Mansion overlay allows us to work with developers to continue to preserve the character of the neighborhood, to preserve the rich history of Strawberry Mansion. We are asking for your support to help in our efforts to be involved as a community who cares. We are asking city council to support this effort and to give us an opportunity to be able to be at the table deciding the future of Strawberry Mansion. Let's work together to accomplish true community economic development as opposed to private economic development. Respectfully submitted Charles Lanier, board president, Strawberry Mansion Neighborhood Action Center. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Oscar, please, sir. And please press your buttons to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me? We hear you. 
sorry. O Oscar Beiser, architectural historian and historic preservationist. Good morning, chairman and members of council. While not a resident of Strawberry Mansion, I support the spirit of this legislation, which with further collaboration and perhaps some concessions will be a great tool for the community and developers. However, as we know, some form of regulation is the only way this will happen. Strawberry Mansion's built environment is an inherited legacy of Philadelphia's architectural heritage that belongs especially to all of the longtime community members, both owners and renters alike. Sadly, as neighborhoods become attractive for new construction, many developers make decisions based entirely on buy right potential, expensive zoning maneuvers, and bottom line factors. The attitude that continues to prevail is they are doing us a favor and we should be grateful whatever crumbs for whatever crumbs we can get. Moving past this pathetic mentality is crucial to the lifeblood of our communities, as well as our promise as a city. While there are many good developers in Philadelphia, too often I have seen beautiful buildings throughout Philadelphia regularly mutilated by non-resident investors and many other landmarks demolished purely out of greed and an astounding lack of vision. Beyond this, most new construction at the neighborhood level is entirely lacking in design and material quality, so much so that it cannot even be described or categorized as, as modern architecture. It is simply savage engineered garbage. The communities that form Strawberry Mansion are simply asking for architectural and design equity and basic respect for the time honored place that they call home. In addition to standards for new construction, council should take up the mayor's historic preservation task force recommendations upon which I served to adopt a tiered approach to historic designation, which would require less stringent design and material standards for designated properties, allowing many communities like Strawberry Mansion to further protect their uh, built environment without burdensome costs. As an ardent preservationist and anti-demolition, I fully understand that compromise is always required. However, all communities deserve to protect their basic assets, which includes their inherited historic built environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Larry Lane. Larry Lane, please press star six to unmute. Larry, uh, Mr. Lane. Hello. Hi, uh, you are connected. So you can state your name for the record and begin with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Larry. Let well, now it's afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Larry Lane, and my family has been have been residents of Strawberry Mansion for in a, for the last sixty nine years. Uh, we've been here, we've seen the good, we've seen the bad, we've seen the migration of people who lived here before us. But I just want to start with saying, we are not anti-development. This Strawberry Mansion Development Coalition is pro-development, but we don't plan to be Brewery Town too. I worked with the City Before Retirement as a Neighborhood Program Coordinator and a Contract Administrator. I know what happened in Brewery Town because in 10 years, Brewery Town was ravaged when there was no community organization to speak for them. Strawberry Mansion is a community of protest. Going back to the first protest for the building of Strawberry Mansion High School. Going back to Strawberry Mansion High School. Um, that was before Gerard College. We have protested because they wouldn't allow black electricians to work on the building of the school. But since then, we have been pro-development with Mother Dabney Square home ownership, with the building of Strawberry Square Mall, collaborating with Sussex in the redoing of the bus barn, which we found to be the only existing uh, bus barn that still existed in the state of Pennsylvania that was a trolley barn. And it was historically redone. CB, CB, uh, CB Moore Home Ownership Project. 
the Friends Home Ownership Project from 31st Street. Oakdale, Gordon, and Monument, all of the streets that we did with a task force with THS. Penrose, Brownstone. And we got the final funding for the $16 million discovery center in the park that converted the, 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 the reservoir into a place that's now called Strawberry Lake for the youth and for everyone in the city to come and visit them. In this community that we've been involved in over $300 million worth of smart development, we want to preserve community care. We want right type development. We are not a blank community as a lot of these urban influences would like to labor us. We just don't want poverty care. We've seen poverty care. Redlining is not something we want to do. We've been the victims of redlining and insurance and mortgages that allowed our communities to, to become the way that they are. The money that was supposed to come in the Strawberry Mansion, coming in North Philadelphia, was stolen from our community during the Rizzo administration to build a gallery downtown with the promise of the money coming back through revenue sharing. The money never came back through revenue sharing because the people refused to allow African Americans to live in Whitman Park. And that's why Penn's Landing was never developed because revenue sharing was taken from Philadelphia. So the PHA is the ones who created to urban renewal all of these vacant properties that I heard one of the developers talk about early on. We have been a victim of all of these. And then people say, look at Strawberry Mansion. Look at North Philadelphia. No, we don't want the new poverty plan to just come in and tell us what they have planned. They have actually said their plan for Strawberry Mansion. We live here. We're professionals. This is a community of choice, not a community of last resort. I've traveled all over the world. Last year, I was just returning from Canada, running ahead of the pandemic. And I can live anywhere I want to. But I choose to live in Strawberry Mansion because of the community that it is. We want right type development. We want we are not a blank community. We will not submit to what urban influencers say. And we just want the opportunity for people to come that want to just make our community look like patchwork to come and look at the beautiful brick and mortar and the things that we've done, just to realize it in redoing the bus barn. Other developers have realized it in, in conjunction with us, and that's all we ask for. We are not a bunch of ragtag people. We are a bunch of professionals, retired professionals, and active professionals that have come together to put this overlay together and taken it to our council person to us be able to preserve the character of the community of Strawberry Mansion. Thank you very much for your time, and we will continue to protest. We will continue to work for the betterment of the people in Strawberry Mansion, some of them who don't even know, because I don't know where all of these other divided voices are coming from now, obviously from the developers' uh, 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 influence on them, because we've been meeting, doing these things for years. And we've never heard their voices. Now, all of a sudden, they come out of the wilderness. Thank you very much. Please support this bill. And support us. And, and I thank you for the support of our councilman for him saying and supporting us. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. This thank is just you. Michelle Murphy. If, if the witnesses can please speak directly into their phone and don't use their, um, their microphone or the, um, you know what I mean. Because it's difficult to hear. You need to speak directly into your phone. Thank you. Brett, please call the next witness. Um, Mr. Chairman, just to make you aware, I also just got a uh, notice from council support that there is a hard stop scheduled for 1230 the mayor's press conference. Um, just so you are aware. To reconvene after, but after, would you like me to call the next witness? In the yes, please call the next witness. Okay. Minal Raval, press star six to unmute. Yes, hi. Yes, please proceed. Sure, thanks. Um, my name is Minal Raval, I'm a resident of Mount Airy. I'm here today to speak on the bill uh, 200654 about city procurement of electricity, gas, and motor fuels. Of course, we need to keep the city humming along. 
This is also an opportune moment to consider the climate crisis and the need to use less gas, gasoline, and diesel. They're all fossil fuels and making it near impossible to breathe, to breathe in the city. Both air quality and emissions reduction need to be included in the decision-making process, not just the cost. It's more than about the dollars. I know of and respect the work of the Office of Sustainability and the Philadelphia Energy Authority on their energy conservation and efficiency across all the city departments and buildings as they work to replace gas heating systems with electric systems, as they work to replace gasoline and diesel vehicles with electric vehicles, and as they invest in solar farms for more of our electricity needs, I ask, can our procurement commissioner show that we as a city will need to purchase Hello? less and less electricity? Yes. Less and less electricity, gas, and motor fuels. I see that this bill authorizes gas procurement from vendors other than PGW. Since we as a city own PGW, I have to ask, shouldn't we be purchasing from within the city and shouldn't we be working with PGW to transition away from gas and still retain and retrain the workforce of PGW? That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would a clerk please call the next witness? Calvin Williams. Calvin Williams, please press This start. is Calvin Williams. Hello. Yes, please see Calvin with your testimony. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and, and, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to be uh, uh, kind of unusually short for people that know me. Uh, again, I am a 70-plus uh, a, a senior and a uh, 19121 zip code North Philadelphia lifer. Now, uh, my ex-wife and my present wife and myself were raised in the uh, uh, Shawswood and the Bury Town uh, and, and uh, uh, Strawberry Mansion area. And uh, uh, our parents owned their homes there, and, uh, 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 and our grandchildren was uh, uh, cared for by them for years. Now, I want to just talk about the two articles for the record. The first article was printed April the 12th, 1991. It was titled, Flight from North Philadelphia, and it was printed in the Philadelphia Inquirer. I'm going to quote, there was a Anthony Dowes, a senior fellow, from the Brookings Institution is quoted as saying, quote, they don't have any resources to renovate. And fundamentally, strategy has to be let them empty out. It goes on, he says, if it totally empties out, then the land prices fall to a level that makes it reasonable. It is not developed now because the 200,000 people there are considered undesirables. When enough of them go away, they then, redevelopment will happen, end of quote. Undesirable nature, neighbors, undesirable. At that time, I had not been living in the city of Philadelphia where my job had had me somewhere else. I read that article, April the 12th, 1991 and i said i got to go back home i have to go back home and from that date april the 12th i put all of my funds together and everything and i came back and i purchased i purchased my home in the 32nd ward and the 23rd division of strawberry mansion now the second article i just want to tell you about is that I did this in 1991, eight months after I read this article. In 1992, March the 14th, 1992, the New York Times representative came to my home to interview me for an article that was named Hope in Inner Cities, Banks Offering Mortgages. And in that article, if you ever get that opportunity that is when I first made my commitment back to home and the Strawberry Mansion. And I have been here ever since, 
and I have put every ounce of my blood and my sweat and my tears in this community. And the audacity of a group of people to come to the neighborhood and tell me what is best for me and my neighbors and my neighborhood without informing me and not sitting down at the table, I have said, could not happen. I'll mention one last thing. The, uh, 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 the uh, uh, Philadelphia City Planning Commission came to our community back in 2002 with the Strawberry Mansion Community Plan strategies for neighborhood revitalization. In their final paper, uh, dated April the 4th, April, April, not April the 4th, April 2004, planned overview and recommendations. On page one of that, they listed five dates, five dates that we put our blood, sweat, and tears in uh, Strawberry Mansion High School, in church basements and everything, with the Planning Commission as a facilitator in two workshops, mapping out the things that we thought was best for us, ourselves. In the conclusion with that, on the page two, in a category that says challenges, those things that were challenges through this whole project, they had eight bullet points. The seventh bullet point said community leadership, suggesting that our leadership capacity in Strawberry Mansion was not strong at all. That was in 2004. This is now. We accepted the challenge then, and that's where we are now. And we are expecting the leadership from our leaders and our elected leaders to help us go forth with this process, and I certainly hope you guys would support this and move it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a quick call the next witness. Sherry Brown, please press star six to unmute yourself. Sherry Brown. Sherry Brown. Good morning, um, Council President, members, and members of City Council. Uh, my name is Sherry Brown, and I would like to speak to one of the concerns that the developers have spoke about and be simply because they don't understand Strawberry Mansion. Um, I'm here to speak about the importance of porches. A lot of times people don't even pay attention to them, but I was born in our home that my parents purchased over 60 years ago. My father had a porch built on the front when he retired from the city of Philadelphia over 30 years ago so that he could step outside of his front door sit back, enjoy the sunshine, and fellowship with our neighbors without leaving the comforts of our home. This encouraged several other neighbors um, on our block to do the same. As of today, families are still using and enjoying these porches. Not only do porches increase the appearance and appeal of a home, it's, it's almost like adding a room that can actually increase the value on an average of about 84% return. Porches make our homes look more spacious and help to improve the curb appeal that creates an inviting interest to our property. It also provides a space where we can watch our children as they play outside and entertain our guests. We are not encouraging bay windows. Um, a lot of times these developers, they come in, they just put up stuff and they do what they want to do. And we don't want enclosed porches either because they all, the two of them actually obscure the ability to see from one end of the block to the other while defeating the purpose, which is to be able to openly see and communicate with our neighbors. Strawberry Mansion was built on the ability of our neighbors to create a community of love for one another with a voice that will be heard. This overlay is not anti-development, and it doesn't support redlining, as Mr. Logan has stated. It is anti-disrespect from developers and people who have moved into Strawberry Mansion within the last five or ten years who feel like they have the right to tell us what we need and want. If you care about the people so much, you um so much so much 
as much, excuse me, as you care about making money off of us, then you would join us at the table, work together in order to maintain the characteristics of Strawberry Mansion while providing affordable housing, affordable home ownership, and the resources to make it better. What is not right or what is not um, for or just is people coming into this neighborhood and just totally disregarding us. We are willing to work with the developers. We are willing to sit down. It's amazing to me how recently they've just come out the woodwork once they got wind of this bill. But I'm asking you, um, City Council, to please support us. Help us to be the people that we were called to be and um, pass this bill. I'd like to thank you so much. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the last witness? Our last witness is John Scott. Please press star six to unmute. And if you could um, ideally limit your testimony to about three minutes, we do have a hard stop at 1230. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we hear you. You can go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of council. My name is John Scott speaking in support of 200613. I am a longtime resident and committee person in the Fishtown neighborhood. I'm an advocate for neighborhood preservation. I joined the Strawberry Mansion call last night and I was welcomed as a guest. And today I'm here to speak with the neighbors. What I saw last night was astounding. We heard developers threatening to take their investment elsewhere if this bill didn't pass. We heard that they couldn't make a profit on a two-story house, that they couldn't do red brick facades and make a project feasible, that if the neighborhood wanted affordable housing, they couldn't dictate design standards. When the neighbors talked about the history of redlining and how the investment going on had been bypassing them, developers told them that bills like this would rob them of capital. It was all about capital and investment. There was no recognition whatsoever that this was a neighborhood and a home for people, not just an investment. The neighbors really had a very simple ask. If you build new houses here, please respect our architectural history. This is something we'd like to see everywhere. The buildings going up are never going to be affordable by any definition, and this bill doesn't change that. It doesn't cost $200,000 to include a red brick facade or to match a porch or a roof line. The drop from 38 feet to 35 feet also changes nothing. Prior to 2012, that was the rule anyway. The only thing this bill does is require luxury houses to look more like the neighborhood. When you're a guest in the neighborhood, you try to fit in. And somebody pointed out, we have overlays everywhere else. Why is Strawberry Mansion different? Why can't the wishes of the mansion neighborhood be respected? So I ask, respect the longtime residents here and everywhere while welcoming the new ones. This bill does both. Please support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here to testify on this bill? Okay, hearing none, we will now conclude this hearing and go into a public meeting. Are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? There being no further questions from members of the committee and no other witnesses to testify, I will add, I will ask. Back on the call at 2 30. And we'll vote on these bills after the recess due to the mayor's press conference. Let's see everyone back at 2 30. Let's please be prompt because we also have a three o'clock committee of the whole area. And so let's get in, let's get out, and um, go from there. Thank you very much for your patience, everyone. Kurt, unless you're going to offer us something, you know. <laughs> we'll be back at 2 30, everybody. Take care. Mm -hmm. 
committed a whole coming up there, right? Absolutely. With a witness list of 35 people. Yeah, that's going to be another one for four hours. Absolutely. You mean? <laughs> We are now live. Thank you very much. Uh, we are calling back to order the this committee on rules. Uh, we have concluded the public hearing of the committee, and we are now going to a public meeting to consider action to be taken on the bills before this committee today. Will the clerk please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that they are present when their names are called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. And we, were we are now convening the public meeting. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mark Swilla. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Present. David O. Good afternoon, Chairman. I am present. Cindy Bass. Good afternoon, Chairman and all. I am present. Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues. I'm here. Bobby Heenan. Good afternoon, Chairman, colleagues. Maria Quinona Sanchez. Curtis Jones, Jr. Mr. Chairman, colleagues and viewing audience, good afternoon. Brian O'Neill. Present. <clears throat> and that is it for the roll, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We are now officially in our public meeting. We will, I will now recognize Council Mark Squilla for a motion to amend bill number 200516. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I offer that the amendment to bill number 200516. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee, and I move that the amendment to bill number 200516 be approved. Second. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Jones seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 200516 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. The motion carries an amendment to bill number 200516. 516 have been approved. Public meeting report the bill number 200516 as amended. The chair recognizes Councilman Squiller for a motion on bill number 200516 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that bill number 200516 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Jones seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200516 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor? Of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Public meeting report bill number 200576. The chair recognizes Council Member Squiller for the motion on bill number 200576. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 200576 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Jones seconds the motion and has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200576 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit reading to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed? The ayes have it and the motion is carried. Public meeting to report bill number 200577. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 200577. <coughs> 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 200577 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Jones seconds the motion and has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200577 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. Public meeting to amend bill number 200592. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark <coughs> Spuller for a motion on the amendment to bill number 200592. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer the amendments to bill number 200592. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 200592 be approved. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Jones seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 200592 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. The motion carries and the amendment to bill number 200592 has been approved. Public meeting to report bill number 200592 as amended. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 200592 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 200592 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit, to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman, Mark, Councilman Jones seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200592 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Public meeting to amend bill number 200601. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on the amendment to bill number 200601. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 200601. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 200601 be approved. Second. Second. Kathy got it. The chair notes. Who? Kathy. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman <laughs> Catherine Gilmore Richardson seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 200601 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. And the amendment to bill number 200601 has been approved. Public meeting to report bill number 200601 as amended. The chair recognizes the council member Mark Squilla for a motion on bill number 200601 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 200601 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Catherine Gilmore Richardson seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200601 as amended be reported from this committee with the favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All in favor, in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Public meeting to amend bill number 200602. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on the amendment to bill number 200602. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 200602. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 200602 be approved. Second. 
The chair recognizes for the record that Councilwoman Kathleen Gilmer Richardson seconds the motion. It has been moved and property seconded that the amendment to bill number 200602 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, aye, aye. 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 Those aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. The motion carries, and the amendment to bill number 200602 have been approved. Public meeting to report bill number 200602 as amended. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on the bill number 200602 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 200602 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Captain Gilmore Richardson seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200602 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the, 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 the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, 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 aye. 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 Those, those opposed, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Public meeting to amend Bill number 200604. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squilla for a motion on the amendment to bill number 200604. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 200604. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 200604 be approved. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Catherine Gilmer Richardson seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 200604 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it. The motion carries and the amendment to bill number 200604 has been approved. Public meeting to report bill number 200604 as amended. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 200604 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to bill number 200604 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Kathleen Gilmer Richardson seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly selected the bill number 200604 as amended to be reported from this committee with the favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the last session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Public meeting to report bill number 2005. Seven one. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squilla for a motion on Bill Number Two Zero Zero Five Seven One. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the Bill Number Two Zero Zero Five Seven One be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation, and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next council session. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Jones seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200571 be reported from this committee with the favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it and the motion carries. Public meeting, meeting to report bill number 200654. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 200654. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 200654 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit the first reading of this bill at the next council session. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Catherine Gilmer Richardson seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200654 be reported from this committee with the favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Public meeting to amend bill number 200613. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on the amendment to bill number 200613. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 200613. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to bill number 200613 be approved. Second. The chair notes for the record that Councilman Jones seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 200613 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. And the motion carries. And the amendment to bill number 200613 has been approved. The public meeting report for bill number 200613 as amended. The chair recognizes Councilman Mark Squiller for a motion on bill number 200613 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill number 200613 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Thank you. The chair recognizes, the chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Cindy Bass seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200613 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. Hmm. We are holding bill number 2005594. Before we, we conclude, please let the record reflect that bill number 200594 is being held at the request of the sponsor. This concludes our rules meeting. And I want to thank everyone um, for their patience. Thank everyone for um, their participation. And I shall see you in our next committee of the whole hearing. Thank you very much, everyone. Good, Good job. job. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank Great you, job. Colleagues. You're welcome, everyone. Thank you, Thank Council you. Member Jones. You're welcome, <laughs> Member <laughs> Thanks.